All right, AP World. More Unit 7 notes, because, you know, we can't get enough. We can't get enough. All right, um, where are we jumping off from here? This is where we left things off, which was France and the Brits uh, completely screwing up the Middle East for all time, um, or at least meddling in it in such a way that has created some issues that we're still dealing with in the 21st century. We'll put it that way. All right, we're going to take a look at uh, some impacts going on in some other parts of the world uh, beyond the Middle East. And so we'll look at South Asia, AKA India. And um, and so we get another another case here of you know yet another country that had uh, had supplied significant assistance to the British Empire uh, during the fighting World War One. Um, a large number of Indian troops ended up fighting. Some of them even uh, in the trenches there in in France, uh, and some of them working in uh, various kinds of support roles. Um, when uh, when the war ends, uh, they're all returned back to India and just same situation we've already talked about. Um, you know, the Indians wait to see, us, is, is this going to result in any kind of change, any kind of benefit to us? And the response from the British is uh, get back to work, okay? Um, except in this case, the, uh, with the protests are going to start breaking out in India. Um, they are going to be a little bit further ahead of the curve uh, compared to some of the other colonies uh, that we talk about here in terms of, of an organized uh, kind of resistance. When we talked uh, earlier on, in fact, in Unit 6, about the, uh, the Indian National Congress uh, being formed up as, a, uh, you know, as, a, as an example of resistance. Um, you know, they're just not like, a, this is an organization, you know, it's not like a bunch of street protesters. Uh, a lot of these are lawyers. They're smart people. And, uh, and then, you know, talked about Mahatma uh, Gandhi eventually uh, jumping in and joining with them. Another, uh, another lawyer by profession, an incredibly intelligent guy. And so uh, they are going to uh, um, not necessarily immediately jump to the lead of these protests, but they're definitely going to have a role. Um, the Armistar Massacre is going to be what in Indian history, when it comes to Indian colonial history, as uh, a bit of a turning point. And uh, this is a, a massacre that takes place um, shooting um, kind of the, the picture you see there is actually a clip from the movie Gandhi, uh, which, you know, if you got five, six hours, it's a really good, good flick to, uh, to spend some time with. Very well done. And Ben Kingsley plays, uh, does an incredible job playing uh, Gandhi himself. Anyhow, um, the, uh, the massacre takes place there in 1919. Uh, in the uh, in the town of uh, Armistar, and it is uh, a protest, peaceful protest uh, by by Indian uh, citizens, uh, men, women, and children. Um, the 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 British government is is taking at that point kind of almost kind of like a zero tolerance policy, and and so uh, troops are marched in um, just to to add to the kind of uh, how we want to how what do we want to call the uh, the, the tragedy of this, but uh, it's Indian troops mainly being commanded by uh, European, by, by British officers. Uh, and they uh, end up opening fire uh, in the crowd and end up killing uh, several hundred people. Um, and, and again, um, well, I, I, I guess the estimate, I should, I should back up there. Estimates are kind of all over the place. Uh, some estimates put it uh, into the thousands, some put it into the hundreds. Um, you know, as you can tell, the British probably leaning on the hundreds and the Indians on the thousands. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is going to be, like I said, this is a significant event because nothing quite this brutal had happened before, um, you know, where it's just that absolutely out there like that, you know, firing into um, a, a crowd of, 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 you know, peacefully protesting uh, civilians. Um and this is really, this is going to also be the event where the Indian National Congress um, really is going to be a, a begin to commit themselves to, you know, all in uh, for Indian independence. Uh, to them, this is a point of no return. There's no amount of apologizing by the British government uh, that is going to make this right. There's, there, you know, to them, this is this blatant power, you know, just, just out of whack. Uh, that, that is on display here. All right. And, uh, and there's where Gandhi really starts to uh, step up and become 
uh, kind of, you know, the man, the myth, the legend that he, that he does become. And uh, Gandhi was a big time practitioner of this concept of nonviolent protest. Um, you know, his, his positioning with his followers is, you know, is basically, and when he referred to the British, he said, we basically have to humiliate them in front of the world. You know, we have to, we have to be able to show their abuse, you know, and, and that, which means we have to sit back and we have to take the blows. Um, but, but, you know, he, he felt strongly that was the only thing that was eventually going to bring the British around and to, uh, to gain the, uh, the Indian people, um, independence. And so, um, the, uh, the salt March was, uh, one of his first big protests, um, just like cotton, uh, the, uh, the British, uh, very tightly, uh, controlled the salt market in, uh, in India. Um, salt was, uh, pretty much just kind of a, a natural resource. Uh, but the, the British went to the point of Kelly, we talked about back in our last unit where, you know, where they were in some of, uh, some of the African colonies where Europeans were passing laws that forbid the African, uh, the indigenous population from doing their own farming. Uh, you know, they would control the food supply. And and the British were pretty much this way as well with the Indians saying that, uh, you know, you don't, you, you don't even get to use any salt for your own, for your own use. If you, if you need salt, you will buy it from us, you know, from the British. Um, and so Gandhi's protest was simply to, uh, to march uh, to I think it was a uh, it was a lake, um, a salt lake, and to uh, and to collect salt, um, you know basically just you know I mean defiance of a British rule, and you know for this he's going to end up being arrested and you know which which he knew was going to happen. That's part of the protest is to you know is to um, is to get yourself in, in trouble with the British, but at the same time then you know when brought into the courtroom. Um, show them how, you know, that they really don't have an argument. And, uh, and Gandhi, uh, ended up, didn't, uh, was, was, was put on, on trial and, uh, and, and ended up walking, uh, because number one, the British were fearful that, uh, to do, to, to take any forceful action with them might cause even more protest. But beyond that, um, he was a smart guy and he was pretty much able to argue as, you know, as a witness for himself, um, just how inane these, these British rules were. All right. Um, so this, this concept of, uh, and, and this is going to, to start in the INC, this debate is going to start up early on here. Um, you know, India, think back to, uh, you know, the Mughal empire and all that. And so by the time we get to the 20th century, India is, is, uh, is kind of an interesting cultural situation in that, you know, about, their, their population split between Muslims and Hindus. I'm not going to say it's 50, 50, but I mean, it, it's pretty evenly divided in there. And, and so, you know, there's, there's already this talk about, I mean, the INC there are kind of, all right, so we, we are going to keep this going until we gain independence. But when we gain independence, you know, what are we going to do about that? And so they're already talking about this concept of a two state solution that they'll actually carve out two countries uh, when they gain independence and create a country that will be specifically for the Muslims and one that's specifically for the Hindus. OK, which is, by the way, foreshadowing or spoiler alert. I don't know. Um, this is exactly what will happen uh, when independence is gained. Um, they'll split the territory into Pakistan and India and uh, Pakistan is Muslim and India is Hindu. Uh, kind of the way it works to this very day. All right. Anyhow, that gives you a little bit of what is going on in India between the wars. Let's take a look at East Asia. Um, during World War I, the Japanese had actually been on the side of the Allies. There was not much fighting in, in Far East Asia. Um, but, uh, but Japan did get to uh, actually uh, gain from, uh, from the war. Some of Germany's far, far east colonies, and, and, and Germany did have a few colonies out in the Pacific, uh, were all awarded to Japan uh, at the Treaty of Versailles. Um, because of, of, well, the fact that, uh, that they had supported, uh, the allies during the war. And so, uh, their empire is growing and, uh, and, and they're not finished. They want more. Um, and, and so, um, 
by this point in time, Japan uh, more or less has control over Korea. Uh, they, had, they had finally seized that. And, uh, and, and the first, the March 1st movement, um, actually, I'm going to give you a, a couple of these because uh, wherever the Japanese are beginning to exert this control as they, you know, now see themselves like, okay, now we are executing the plan. We're going to be like Europe. We're going to create our own empire. You know, ours will just be out here in Asia. Uh, but but they do get some pushback. Uh, the Koreans uh, they they protest uh, with this March first movement in 1919. It is a protest over you know what they see as this you know basically they're losing their independence uh, in effect to uh, to Japan, and so uh, they are pushing back. And then um, by this point in time, you know even going back to the uh, the Sino Chinese War. Uh, from back uh, at the late late nineteenth century, uh, Japan is is kind of uh, nibbling, you know, at the edge of of China as well, and so the uh, the Chinese May Fourth movement is likewise very similar. Okay, a little kind of yeah uh, to what Korea does, and and again, you know, trying to protest for their own people and and kind of protesting, hoping the word the world. Uh, will get the message that, uh, hey, you guys need to watch, you know, Japan. They're getting a little pushy out here. And so uh, their own set of protests against this growing Japanese power. All right. Let's see. Um, I guess we're going to keep it in uh, in China. Uh, and and we'll, we'll look at uh, the, uh, the creation in the 1920s of the CCP. All right. The Chinese Communist Party. Um, this is a, a, a party that is going to take, uh, needless to say, it's an inspiration from, uh, from Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, and they form up as a, a rather small organization, but they are very much going to jump into this idea of tapping into the huge peasant population of, of China and and basically offering up to this peasant population that, you know, communism will level the playing field, uh, will, will bring them out of, you know, the peasantry and into a, a life that, uh, you know, is going to provide, you know, this, that, and the other, so much, such a, a, a better uh, standard of living. Opposed to them is going to be the, uh, the government of, of China at that time. This is going back to the revolution, Sun Yat-sen. Uh, the Chinese Nationalist Party has been... Uh, the controlling party in China since then. Uh, remember, originally kind of modeled off of, you know, a United States slash kind of democratic uh, government, but really um, in action, it's not looking so much like that. Um, it's a little bit more, um, a little less freedom-y. Um, yeah, I, that's, that, that's the best I can give you on that. Uh, you know, it's like they're trying, but, you know, they're coming from a country that has zero democratic uh, tradition. And so it's uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a rough go um, in parentheses, parentheses there, Kunmintang, uh, that is just the uh, the Chinese name for the Chinese Nationalist Party, or sometimes you'll see it as the KMT. All right. Kunmintang, um, if we're going to try to get away from, you know, the anglicized name for that. Um, the Chinese Communist Party, this will be the rise of Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao uh, will early on just be one of many of the, uh, the kind of you know, middle leadership of the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, there's nothing early on that would point out to the fact that he was going to be anything special. Um, but still, he didn't come from, you know, these, you know, he, he was not of the peasantry himself. Let's put it that way. Um, his, his parents were kind of flirting there on the line with the middle class. And Mao actually was able uh, to get some education as a, uh, as a young man. Um, he will be facing off against Chiang Kai-shek, who will be the leader of uh, the KMT of the Nationalist Party. And as you can kind of tell from the picture over there on the right side of, uh, of Chiang Kai-shek, um, you know, again, while the KMT is, is that's kind of window dressing there as being more of a democratic style political movement, um, Chiang himself was a little bit a little too, um, I don't know, he, he loved all the military pomp and, you know, all that kind of thing. I mean, most of the time when you saw him, he was in a military uniform. And, uh, and so, 
you know, like I said, trying to pull away from a many, 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 many centuries of, of, of tradition is going to be a challenge. And ultimately you could kind of argue, um, is going to contribute to the way that the, the civil war in China is going to end up turning out. All right. Um, because civil war is what breaks out by the time you get to the 1930s. And it is. It's the uh, the communists fighting against the nationalists. Um, the long march is a reference to uh, really, it, it, it sounds a lot better than the long retreat. Uh, because um, really it was this uh, this massive, uh, more than 500 miles, trust me. Okay, don't, 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 don't be fooled by the the meme over there. Um, they're making reference to a good old 80s song. Uh, no, it was thousands of miles. And, uh, and it came after a, a series of fighting down in the southern part of China, uh, where the CCP um, didn't do too well against nationalist troops. And, uh, and so they sought to, uh, to basically head north to where there were more uh, communists based in the northern part of China and uh, to get up there and combine forces. So, you know, I mean, they call it the Long March because, well, because the CCP gave it this name and, and this became almost kind of like, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware, it kind of, you know, ended up being this kind of legendary status. Um, and it, and it killed off, I think they, they estimate 80 to 90% of the communists on this march died of uh, conditions, starvation, every once in a while combat. And it also killed off most of the leadership uh, of the CCP. By the time they finally made it up north, Mao Zedong was one of the last ones left. And the fact that, you know, somehow he had survived uh, kind of cemented his mystique as a, uh, as a leader. And it won't be too long after that that Mao will be basically cemented in as the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. So that is the significance of the Long March, all right? In 1935, uh, the KMT and the CCP um, established a truce. And you're thinking, wait a minute, they've been trying to destroy each other. Uh, you know, you got this civil war going. What, what, why, why did they just call, just what? Just, we're just going to call it a draw? No. Uh, by 1935, uh, the growing threat of Japan is beginning to be too much for China to ignore. And the KMT and the CCP agree to put their differences to the side and to face the, China, the, the Japanese threat. Uh, together, all right. I mean, bottom line, if they're conquered by the Japanese, um, doesn't matter whether you're a nationalist or a communist, because you're all going to be under the control of Japan. So that is the uh, the reason for that. And sure enough, I mean, even really before this had happened, Manchuria was not part of China, uh, although there's you know that historic connection to it. But doggone it, it's close enough. Manchuria is you know their neighbor to the north. And uh, when Japan marches into uh, Manchuria in 1931 and conquers it and renames it Manchuko, um, you know th that that's the kind of fear that's beginning to uh, beginning to to trickle down into uh, into China. And so, yeah, that's that's where this this truce comes from. All right. And then uh, let's see where are we going to go from. Oh, okay, we're going to flip it over to uh, to Africa. And uh, a little bit of uh, what is is going on between the wars over there. Decolonization. There's a fancy word for you. And uh, decolonization, if I haven't mentioned it already in the unit, it is just uh, more of a kind of a, a geography history term that refers to the process of a colony being returned back to its indigenous or native people. All right. Freedom, independence, that sort of thing. Um so West Africa uh, and West Africa will end up being one of the, the part of Africa that will first see colonies uh, given their freedom, although this won't happen until after World War II. But we'll be, the seeds are being sown. Let's just put it that way. OK, um, you know, we have a bunch of French colonies uh, that are in uh, West Africa and then a smattering of some British in there as well. Um, but uh, what, what starts going on uh, in between the wars is. Um, kind of like we're seeing in India, and that is a little bit of some, some direct pushback, okay? Uh, something the Europeans are not used to seeing. 
uh, African workers going on strike, uh, African workers uh, in force, you know, refusing to work. So it's kind of like, you know, go ahead, try to punish us. You know, there's thousands and thousands of us, uh, that kind of a thing. And, and kind of like we have in India, remember, you know, we talked about a lot of the, uh, the leaders of the INC, their lawyers, many of them have been educated in Europe. Uh, the same thing is going on here in some of these West African uh, colonies is now there you, you're seeing protests being led by European educated um, Africans who, you know, again, who had been handpicked uh, to get that education with the understanding that they would then help in the running and the administering of the, uh, the colony and give, you know, a kind of a thin veneer of, you know, kind of, you know, you know, look, you're being run by your own people, <laughs> you know, kind of a kind of an idea. Um, and in in the in the case of France and some of those West African colonies where this uh, movement breaks out, um, they don't give freedom. That's they're not going to go down there crazy here. But they actually um, they they do improve work conditions and uh, and extend some uh, additional rights to uh, to the African people in their colonies. So it's it's a small victory. Uh, again, independence is the main goal, but they get something, and and that's. That's something, all right, because uh, there have been very little of that before. All right, I'm going to take uh, maybe another slide or two here, and we're going to start setting up some of the backgrounds to World War II, specific backgrounds. First one we haven't really talked about yet, and that is the rise of Nazism, all right? Here we go. Um, so I think I've mentioned already, directly after World War I ends, the, uh, the new democratic government of Germany is called the Weimar Republic. Okay, I know it's like Weimar, but it's Weimar, Weimar, all right? Um, and uh, and it is going to be a, a government that uh, is going to, by most of the German people, it's weak, okay? I mean, you know, they go through that hyperinflation uh, after World War I. Um, you know, Germany also struggles mightily with, uh, with unemployment after World War I. Uh, you know, I mean, here you are, you're, you're trying this new government after having been a country for what, 50, 60 years, you know, pretty much under authoritarians, you know, monarch, monarchy, and you're trying this new government out that's, you know, supposed to be, you know, more freedom and all that. And all you're seeing is trouble. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't take hard to put two and two together and it's like, all right, maybe, you know, we liked it better under the authoritarian. Um, and so it really does shake uh, German faith in this new experiment uh, that is going on. And, and for a lot of Germans, it's kind of, you know, it convinces them that this just, you know, basically democracy will not work uh, in this country. Uh, we, you know, just we need something. We need something else. Um, <laughs> boom. And there we go. There's something else. Um the rise of uh, Adolf Hitler and, and then the creation of the Nazi party. So um, Hitler, uh, unlike what a lot of other people, some people may believe, he did not create the Nazi party. The Nazi party already existed. Matter of fact, uh, Hitler uh, had been sent to, to go spy on the uh, the Nazi party. He was, uh, after World War I, he was still um, basically in the military uh, but was working on more of kind of like an intelligent side of it and was checking in and making sure that, you know, there weren't extremist groups out there plotting to overthrow the German government. And uh, he went in and ended up sitting in with a, a couple of, uh, of meetings with the National Socialist German Workers Party, which when you uh, put that in German and, and abbreviate it, that's where we get Nazis. Anyhow, he... Uh, he sits in with them for a while, try to determine, are these guys a threat? And he decided in the end, yeah, they're a threat and I'm going to join. And, um, and, and it was at that point that he uh, was, it was discovered that, that, that Hitler had this gift, uh, that when he got in front of a, a bunch of people and started talking, um, almost, it was like he was placing a spell over them. A very, very magnetic speaker, uh, hard to ignore. And a guy that just kind of channeled all that rage and anger. And, and uh, that's what the National Socialist German Workers Party was all about. You know, they're one of these parties that, you know, kind of the grievances from uh, the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles. Oh, yeah. Um, he is all over that. Uh, this party is uh, rather small. It's kind of located down the southern part of Germany in Munich. And, uh, but uh, small as they are, they, uh, they, you got to give them credit. They, they, boy, they plan big. 
And uh, not too long after Hitler takes, uh, it pretty much ends up in, you know, as, as the leader, they plan, um, they plan basically a, a revolution. Um, they're in the city of Munich, and they believe that uh, when they uh, take over the city, that that will be kind of like the first domino in a process of, of, of a revolution that's going to bring down the Weimar Republic and uh, leave Germany with, uh, well, somehow magically the Nazis in control. Um, this, uh, this attempted revolt, which comes down through history to be known as the Beer Hall Putsch, uh, because uh, Beer Hall is where the Nazis march out of to start their revolution, it doesn't go so well. Matter of fact, the police uh, in Munich, uh, they have other plans, and before the night is over, a bunch of Nazis are dead. Hitler, pretty darn close to... Uh, taking a bullet himself, but instead is just under arrest and put on trial for treason. Um, because the sympathy uh, in, in southern Germany uh, for the Nazis was so strong, the judge uh, gave him a, just a really, really weak sentence. I mean, it's kind of a slap on the hand. Yeah, you tried to you know overthrow the government. Here's a few years in prison, which actually ended up, I think, being close to about six months. Um, because, you know, the judge probably was kind of uh, thinking the same thing, that, uh, yeah, we need to overthrow this weak government. Uh, when Hitler is in prison, he writes a book, and uh, the book is kind of his blueprint uh, for Germany, My Struggle, um, German Mein Kampf. And, um, and anyone who wanted to know um, what Hitler had planned for Germany and, by extension, the world, uh, could have popped this book open in the late, you know, mid late 1920s, and it's all there. It's not a secret. You know, it's it's all there. He talks about uh, you know the need for Germans to uh, you know to uh, to have more more kind of land to be able to uh, what he calls Lebensraum, living space. Uh, he talks about you know how the uh, the Treaty of Versailles just uh, basically needs to be shredded and you know move on. Um, a lot of stuff that uh, is mentioned in this book. Okay. Um, he definitely, uh, definitely lays in heavy uh, on a lot of the grievance politics going back to the Germany's uh, defeat in World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, he uh, writes and later on will, will speak extensively about what he refers to as the stab in the back, uh, which is the notion that uh, German soldiers were, you know, bravely fighting, you know, to the death in the trenches uh, there going into 1918. And uh, while they were facing the enemy, uh, trying to defend the fatherland, they were figuratively stabbed in the back. And those who were holding the knife, according to Hitler, were communists, uh, weak democratic politicians, and Jews. And uh, this is going to be Hitler's theme, is to focus in on this small religious minority uh, in Germany and, and take advantage of a long history of anti-Semitism in Europe and, uh, and to connect Germany's defeat in World War I to the meddling of, of Jews and others, okay? A lot of times when Hitler would talk about communists, uh, it was almost kind of a direct correlation that he was just referring to Jews at the same time, uh, in, in his mind, um, you know, because there was such a large Jewish population in in Russia, uh, you know, he kind of just conflated the communist revolu revolution uh, with the Jewish population. And so, you know, to an extent, they were almost kind of hand in hand in, in his, his way of looking at things. Uh, but this this is going to be a way for him to rally the German people to uh, to the Nazi cause. Uh, is to tell the, you know them to tell the soldiers of World War and all these vets you didn't lose the war you know I mean you you can hold your head up high you did not lose the war uh, you were stabbed in the back you know while you were doing your bit um, these these weak you know and and conniving uh, people uh, conspired to uh, to 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 drag Germany down and and we have not just a right, we have a responsibility to, to get revenge, you know, to, to avenge ourselves for this incredibly, you know, horrible wrong that's been done to us. And, uh, and so all of that does tap into, to Hitler's, um, just some of his, his thinking about, uh, 
uh, about race. Uh, he, he would have been definitely a, a strong adherent of uh, social Darwinism. Um, Again, his anti-Semitism, uh, most historians who've analyzed Hitler and, you know, psychoanalyzed Hitler, you know, they, they believe, I mean, it wasn't just an act. It wasn't just something that he kind of leaned in on uh, to, to try to build support. I mean, he believed it. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of evidence out there that when he was a young man in, uh, in living in Vienna, in Austria, before he joined the German army, um, he went through some struggles down on his luck. Um, you know, life was not working out, and and he fell in with with other anti semites that you know kind of you know kind of played the victim card, and you know our lives are miserable because you know because these people aren't um, you know kind of thinking, uh, and so he, he combined that with these these ideas of I don't know, going back into German history and some of it going back to medieval times and. Uh, just viewing Germanic uh, culture and 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 looking at at Germans not just as a nationality. I mean, th this is where Hitler's thinking just gets so. Oh my goodness, uh, because he he views the Germans as a race. Okay, he he views Jewish people likewise. They're not just a religion; they're a race. Uh, he views everything through these weird kind of you know racial uh, kind of kind of ways of of you know, seeing the world and, and he believes that this Germanic race, okay, no, we're not talking about a nation anymore. We're talking about a country, um, uh, that, that they are superior and that, uh, that they are almost kind of like, you know, God's chosen, uh, to, uh, to rule over Europe and beyond. And so, uh, yeah, that's where we get all of that. Okay. And so, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and and cut it here being worth 30 minutes and I still have further to go, but we'll, we'll cover some of that in class. Um, but, uh, no, in, in, um, in Mein Kampf, uh, he, he speaks about that. He speaks, I mean, he, he rants and raves about, uh, about the Jewish people. He, he, uh, goes on about, uh, his beliefs about, you know, Germany's special place, uh, in, uh, in world history. And, and he does, he, he talks about, um, the need for a militarily rebuilt Germany. Uh, forget about what the Treaty of Versailles says about stripping Germany of its military power. Hitler says, you know, basically that uh, that the the treaty was um, just it, it's it's invalid. You know that uh, that that it was that that Germany was cheated, and uh, that they deserve to have a large military again. And that they then plan on, uh, you know, that that living space. And Hitler makes no bones about it. He's looking to the east for that living space. He hates communism, and uh, and he figures that by by squashing communism and and the threat that communism poses to, you know, the rest of Europe, that he takes care of two things. He destroys a political movement that he's opposed to, and also opens up a vast territory for for Germans to overspread. And uh, he always has these visions of kind of going back to medieval times of these, you know, these these massive estates in uh, in you know uh, out in the east in Russia uh, that are that are run by you know these German princes and you know and these Russian peasants that are working for them as you know basically as slave labor, uh, you know that's kind of the dream. And and he writes about elements of all this in Mein Kampf. So no surprises, okay? When uh, you know when World War II uh, breaks out. No surprises, because uh, Hitler had uh, pretty much laid it all out for the world. If you were willing to read it, and the book was translated into a ton of different languages, um, don't know if it ever really came a bestseller in any real big way, but uh, I know it became quite popular in Germany at uh, you know uh, about the time that Hitler was rising to power. Anyhow, I'm rambling, and uh, so let me uh, hit the brakes here, and like I said, we'll uh, hit some more on the Nazis uh, when we're back in class together. Till then.